welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. So does healthy look different during the summer than say the fall, winter, or spring? Well, according to my guest today, the answer is yes. And I gotta admit, I agree with him. So stay tuned on that. And by making tweaks to your diet and routine based on the time of year, you might be able to become more in tune with your body and enjoy better health as a result. So in a moment, I'm going to be speaking with the acclaimed health expert, Dallas Hartwig, and you probably recognize that last name. Dallas is the co-founder of The Whole30, a popular diet program that stresses eating whole foods. In his newest book, The Four Season Solution, he shares why and how to bring your body into harmony with your surroundings. Today, we'll talk about how to sync up with your environment and feel like the best, most healthy version of yourself. Dallas, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me. So you've become uh, an authority on healthy, balanced living. Uh, can you tell me what attracted you to this area in the first place? Sure. Um, it was certainly by no genius plan. Uh, you know, there was no master scheme at the beginning of my life or in university or anything. It was more a function of um, part personal experience um, in the sense that I grew up in a family where my parents always valued um, health and taking care of our bodies. And then also um, professional um, background. My undergraduate degree is anatomy and physiology. I went on to grad school for physical therapy, always kind of cared about the rehabilitative aspects of things as well as the athletic performance side of things. And so always kind of, it was always sort of woven into my structure all the way along. And um, back in 2006 and seven, when I started doing more reading on nutrition specifically, and then ultimately what became a seminar series and um, three books, um, I started writing and speaking more on nutrition because I recognized its foundational impact on our quality of life. Um, but it was sort of, I sort of described myself as a, as an accidental author, um, more than anything else. Uh, were, were you the, the, the chef and cook of, of the dynamic duo? <laughs> I think we were probably fairly equally matched in that realm. Um, and for the first whole 30 book, we uh, got a friend of ours, Richard Bradford, to actually create all new recipes. So he was the actual chef. Um, but both Melissa and I really enjoyed cooking as well. Ah, so uh, so you would dirty your hands in the uh, in the kitchen? For sure. Yeah. I, I mean, my I was very fortunate to grow up in a family that um, my mom always um, experimented with different kinds of cooking and different ingredients and was very much into whole foods. And I spent a good portion of my childhood as a vegetarian and we had a huge vegetable garden. We preserved a lot of our own food. So food and where it came from and what to do with it has always been, um, near and dear for me. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, my, my mother was, was the cook in the family and actually a, at a young age, uh, I was in the kitchen, you know, cooking with her from day yeah. one. My father, just as a hilarious story, uh, could not cook, uh, didn't need to because my mother was so good at it. But uh, one of the funny stories, my, uh, my mother was, you know, was babysitting our young children in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and my parents at that time lived in Omaha. And she left my father some Kraft macaroni and cheese uh, boxes to cook. And the, the first night he called her and he says, there's something terribly wrong. Uh, this is this is like macaroni and cheese soup. It's just pure water, and she said, <laughs> "You didn't drain the water, you, you know, you moron." <laughs> he said, well, it, 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 so that's that's my father's sum total of experience in cooking. Fair enough. And he, well, he, he killed <laughs> it, it. Seems like he had. It seems like he had a, a good uh, teammate then. <laughs> yeah. So. What what inspired you to write the four season solution, which is which is definitely different than you know where you've been before with your books? For sure, I mean it's it's the same but different. Um, it's different in the sense that it's not a, a, fu a function or um, a focus primarily on food, although it does address that. Um, I describe the four season solution as the prequel to it starts with food um, to my first book. Um, and, you know, I think it's kind of evident that the title, It Starts With Food, is kind of a good statement 
um, about the centrality and the influence of nutrition on our overall health. But it's just the starting point. It's just one foundational piece. And so my attempt with the Four Seasons Solution is to give people a larger perspective, um, a more integrated perspective, a more holistic approach to putting different lifestyle components. And in the book, I detail about food, about movement, about sleep, but not quite just sleep, more about the light dark cycle more broadly and about connection. And we often think about connection as connection to other people, but it's also connection to ourselves, connection to a place, a sense sort of sense of belonging and a connection to the earth. And then also a connection to a sense of purpose, something greater than ourselves. Um, so I, I put all those pieces together into a system um, to give people an opportunity to put foundational health uh, behaviors into place in a way that works, in a way that's sane, and that doesn't require them to spend their entire bandwidth of their sort of disposable time, so to speak, um, on um, getting progressively more granular with health and lifestyle choices, because I think that really ultimately erodes the other opportunities to have more interesting, diverse, rich human experiences. This book talks all about, you know, your, how your behaviors should change depending upon the type uh, the time of the year. Uh, we become so disconnected and kind of above our environment and we control everything. Uh, help us walk back and Try to convince me and my listeners, you don't have to convince me, um, <laughs> why it's so important to be in tune with circadian rhythms, time of year. Uh, sure. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I think there's a, a, a fundamental idea here um, called evolutionary mismatch. And really the idea there is that um, the world that we evolved in for the vast majority of human history is the world that our current bodies are the majority of our current genetic makeup sort of expects and is most adapted to. And of course, evolution is an ongoing process and we have ongoing adaptations to a more modern environment, but it happens relatively slowly relative to the short span of time since the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution, and then later sort of technological and digital ages. So we found ourselves in a world that looks very much unlike what our bodies are adapted for. And in the realm of food, it's quite obvious, you know, the, when you go into the corner store and you see the food packaged in foil packets that it has an indefinite shelf life that is in fluorescent colors it's quite easy to understand that that is not the food we are well adapted to 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 nourish us and to kind of live to kind of live an optimal life on and um the principle that is kind of i can extrapolate that that principle to a larger picture and say um the entire modern world is constructed in a very different way than the natural world. It is binary, right? The light switch is on, the light switch is off. We are at work, we are off work. Um, we are awake, we are asleep. And it become, has become very digitized and binary, and that is not the way biology works. Uh, when we think about the amount of light that's present outside throughout the course of the day, it is a gradual moving from very dark to a little bit lighter, to a little bit lighter, to lighter, 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 and then a gradual fade away. And all of our systems are like that. So whether we're talking about digestive function or detoxification or the synthesis of neurotransmitters or any of those things, they all happen in, in sort of progressively gradated ways rather than binary ways. And the mistake we've made in the modern world is trying to fit a, a very dynamic oscillating organism into a very um, linear and binary world. And it simply doesn't work. We are not computerized machines. And my argument that's central in the book is that in introducing or reintroducing rather some of those um, oscillations into our everyday lives, we are then able to undo some of the harmful evolutionary mismatches we've created with this modern world. Um, so that looks like addressing our movement patterns, what we eat, when we eat. Um, it looks at addressing the light and dark cycles. It looks at addressing even the way that we connect with other people or are more withdrawn introspective. And I think that's a piece that isn't discussed enough in the world right now. So let's, let's, let's take me through, give me something that I can change that I have control over uh, right. in this crazy environment. Uh, 
Okay, it's, it's spring you know, for most of us, although uh, I guess there's snow some places. Uh, you're in Salt Lake City, uh, still snow on the mountains, I know. For sure. Uh, so give me some changes in spring that you talk about in the book. And sure. That we're not doing, perhaps. Right. So I'll, I'll kind of describe what the, the sort of the sensation of spring is like in general. And we're already very familiar with it. It's probably the most palpable of the seasons. It is um, excitement and energy and anticipation. It is um, spontaneous activity, whether that is cleaning out the garage or putting the garden in or doing work in the yard or going for a run that you haven't done in months um, starting a new exercise program, starting a new hobby. It's the initiation. And so much of that is driven by the hormone um, or the, rather the neurotransmitter dopamine. It's the, the neurotransmitter of motivation and drawing us towards new things and exploration and novelty. And that's what spring is all about. So that energy of spring carries over into, let's talk about movement. Um, over the course of a deep, dark, cold winter, we may have um, sort of had the downturn in mood and motivation. We have maybe have not exercised as often, um, or maybe we've simply done it in shorter, more intense bursts. Um, something like, uh, downhill skiing, uh, something like going to the gym and doing weight training. Um, but we are less likely to be outside for, you know, eight hours doing a long, uh, snowshoe or a long, uh, bike ride because 10 in, in most places with temperate climates, that's just simply less agreeable um, from, from a physical activity standpoint. So spring is the emergence out of the semi hibernative state of winter. And it's such a, such an energizing experience. And I think most people think of spring as like, it's fun, it's new, uh, it's exciting. And, um, spring is a really fun season to be in. Um, the great thing about spring also is that the food availability, again, in places that have different seasons really changes, right? Um, so in the winter time, if we're eating locally and seasonally, um, we're doing a lot of meat and fat and, you know, easily preserved, you know, root vegetables and squashes and those types of things. But in the spring, we've got this whole new crop of, you know, early spring greens and perhaps strawberries and there's things that are coming up, you know, fairly early. And so we have new opportunities for varied foods there as well. And one of the sort of simple heuristics I write into the book about food is eat the foods that are available locally and seasonally in your area. And if you move to a different place, that means you eat different foods. Um, and that is in part because it's, I, I love simple heuristics and simple ways of kind of thinking about this stuff, but also it's simple, but it's also perfectly in line with what our bodies would expect when we are more in sync with our local light and dark cycles as well, right? So it's none of these things exist in isolation. So in the springtime, it also means we might start getting up a little bit earlier. Um, we might start staying up a little bit later, although asterisks there depends on how much how late we've been staying up, you know, in the winter time anyway. So um, a lot of the success of each successive phase or each successive season depends on the how much we sort of immerse ourselves in the preceding season from a hormonal standpoint, from a recovery standpoint, because I think it's easy to, to imagine not having that spontaneous energy of spring if we have um, run ourselves ragged all winter and stayed up late and uh, not gotten enough sleep and been under chronic stress and eaten an inflammatory, low nutrient diet, et cetera. We're not going to emerge into spring feeling spontaneously energetic. And all of those things are true for each of the seasons. So there's sort of a, a sequence that needs to be laid out there. Um, and spring just happens to be the season that we're in right now for the northern hemisphere. Um, and it's the most fun, but um, it's also only part of the story. So let's, uh, you mentioned hibernation. So we're just coming out of winter in the northern hem hemisphere. And you talked about, um, for instance, I have many friends in Seattle and Portland uh, who consume eight cups of coffee a day in the winter uh, because they're, they're so depressed and it's gray. And I trained in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the University of Michigan. And quite frankly, it is gray for nine months out of the year. And, for sure. And, so, so let's back up into winter. Do we fight against that kind of 
we really need to hibernate, we really need to shorten our days, or do we embrace that? And if we embrace it, how do we do that? Well, that's the challenge, right? Because winter is the sort of archetype or the symbolic season that is most at odds with our modern world. So I talk about um, the idea of a chronic summer in the book, and I use the word chronic to designate the sort of long-term nature of it. But I also use it because chronic summer is directly connected with chronic disease. So there is that direct tie in there because the features of summer of excessive stress, long days, short nights, under recovery, effectively lack of an adequate sleep and recovery, um, a relatively high carbohydrate and perhaps lower nutrient um, food supply, again, sort of asterisks, depending on which food choices you're making, and huge amounts of, acti of physical activity um, emphasizing duration rather than intensity. And so there's sort of that component there. And um, in the wintertime, it's the opposite of that. And that's really hard to, to do when we have uh, work or school schedules that tell us to be up at a certain time, to be at the office at a certain time. And um, so the, the fixed scheduling of the modern world is one of the biggest problems um, when it comes to into, um, integrating some of my recommendations because there's only so much flexibility that a lot of us have. So to your point, conceptually, um, I think I would say the the best way to implement my recommendations here is to make as many changes as you can to be as in sync and lined up with the current season as it is outside in your natural environment as pra as practically possible. And that's going to be very personal. So for some people, it's going to be, um, you know, if they are self-employed with a flexible schedule and they work from home, they will sleep in a lot later in the winter and start dimming the lights and getting ready for bed a lot earlier in the winter. Um, but for other people who have less flexibility in that particular arena, what it underscores is the importance of really getting on track with the things you can control and the things you can change. So ideally, yes, we go into a, uh, a down cycle of energy and a sort of withdrawn restorative state in the winter that looks a little bit like a hibernation. And, you know, in some cases, I think that there's even a certain aspect of a sort of mildly depressive um, kind of feature of winter behavior that's actually physiologically normal. Um, that is, that it, it does prompt us to kind of withdraw and rest and heal from the chronic stress of, of summertime. Um, and so it's no wonder then that so many of us have that same kind of uh, lethargic, depressive kind of symptom because really what our bodies are saying is you need some restorative time to recover from your chronic stress. Um, so that can be applied to any of the seasons because for most of us, we have lived so far out of sync with any of the natural seasons that we need to um, really do sort of a, a therapeutic intervention and it's sort of an offset for that chronic imbalance. So um, I think you've alluded to this. Where, where does control of our lighting uh, factor into this? Because it is partially under our control. Absolutely. It's, it's largely under our control, fortunately. And, you know, again, exceptions to this would be people who are on call or who do shift work. Um, but for most of us, it's largely within our, within our control. And that's a really beautiful thing because the presence of bright light, um, you know, particularly the blue wavelengths really has a significant alerting effect to our neurophysiology. So, um, you know, I view it simply as blue light, um, meaning kind of a, either light that's actually blue or bright white kind of cool temperature light that contains a lot of those blue wavelengths. That's the message to our brains um, that it is blue sky midday. We should be alert. We should be ready to go. There is a potential threat. We need to kind of be alert to what's around us. And studies show that um, bright lights containing the blue wavelengths have a, a comparable alerting effect to a small amount of caffeine. So there is this very alerting awakening effect there. And we can really use that to our advantage. But I think more importantly, we can use the removal of that bright light, especially that blue light, um, at times when it doesn't belong, also to our advantage. So that looks like um, in the winter specifically, because it's getting dark so much earlier, it looks like um, dimming the lights and um, dimming the lights significantly and staying away from sources of blue light. And um, I'm very glad to see that there's a lot of conversation now around 
um, healthy sleep habits around sleep hygiene, around, you know, avoiding blue light in the hours before bed, et cetera. And that's really important. So I underscore the importance of all of that. And I think there's a little more to it than just avoiding blue light. And here's why. Um, what the research seems to show is that there's a comparable influence on our circadian rhythms of the presence of bright natural light early in the day in a way to anchor and synchronize all of our different body systems um, that has just as much, if not more, impact on our circadian biology than the inappropriate presence of blue light after dark. So said another way, getting enough natural light early in the day is really important and perhaps even more important than avoiding blue light in the evenings. And so the, I'd like to kind of shift the conversation a little bit um, around light um, instead of saying, okay, I can just put on these blue blocking glasses and continue watching Netflix at 10 PM right before I fall into bed. I think that's a little bit missing the point because it's not just the blue light and the way it affects our physiology, but there's also the idea that if we are on our computers, answering work emails or watching a psychological thriller on, on Netflix, there's also a lot of other psycho, psycho emotional stimuli that are going on there that can also bring up our cortisol levels, blunt the release of melatonin, and basically make it difficult for us to ease into that deep restorative sleep mode. So the great thing about light is that we can, to your point, largely control it. And I think that's a really wonderful thing because we can both add in natural light with five or 10 or 15 minutes of faces in the sun, um, you know, not, not staring at the sun, obviously, but in the bright natural light. Even if it's overcast outside, it still dwarfs the amount of light we would get inside, even with bright artificial light. Um, and in the book, I write about the sort of the measurement of brightness, the measurement of, of light there um, in Lux. And if we are outside on a cloudy day, it's going to be around 10,000 Lux, plus or minus. And to give you a sense of scale, if we are inside in a department store or a grocery store that feels really brightly lit, um, the amount of light there is only about four or 500 Lux. So it's a tiny fraction of the actual amount of light that we would get if we were outside, even on an overcast day. So people will say, but it's not that sunny in Ann Arbor. Um, and I say, it's okay. 10 minutes of being outside, even on an overcast day, really helps to anchor and synchronize your circadian rhythms even more than um, bright light in, a, in an artificial sense, which is surprising to a lot of people and was to me when I first came upon this research. Hmm. So, you know, an interesting anecdote, uh, when, I, uh, when I moved to California uh, years ago, and particularly in the Southern California area, uh, I would go back to the University of Michigan or spend a lot of time over in Europe, particularly in the winter, lecturing and attending conferences and uh, operating in numerous hospitals. And I was struck, something I hadn't ever noticed, that the University of Michigan Hospital was dim compared to what I was used to in Southern California, mm. and the same way it was in Europe. I'm going, why don't they have any? You know, why don't they have any bright lights? What's the deal? Well, of course, in the winter in Southern California, particularly in Palm Springs, it's uh, pretty bright. And for sure, uh, our hospital was very bright, and it never occurred to me until I went back to winter climes that people, whether they knew it or not, and this was fairly universal, had had adjusted their light level down for winter. And it turns out it was probably a really good idea. I think so. I think so. I think the thing that we sometimes miss the opportunity to do is to introduce more oscillation across the course of our day. So in the book, I talk about this idea of dark days and bright nights, um, sort of an inversion of what the natural light pattern would be. Because when we're inside, even, you know, in a brightly lit hospital, it might, unless there's enormous, uh, you know, huge windows and tons of skylights, um, it's still only going to be several hundred lux as compared to up to 100,000 lux at midday full sun on a, on, a, on a clear day. So again, it feels bright when we're inside, but the amount of light we're actually getting is still quite small. So I do encourage people to really make sure they get some time in natural light every single day, ideally within an hour of waking to really coordinate those, those circadian clocks because we are, of course, familiar with the concept of jet lag, of changing our circadian rhythms by some number of hours by flying to a different time zone um, to a different part of the Earth. But really, that's what happens if we have either 
a lack of bright natural light to anchor our circadian rhythms, to synchronize all of our body systems, or if we have different going to bed and different wake times at different days of the week, we're effectively experiencing jet lag all the time on kind of an ongoing basis. So that circadian rhythm disruption is increasingly recognized as a risk for all manner of chronic disease, certainly cardiovascular disease and many others. So what about, why don't I just buy a full spectrum light bulb and stare at it for 15 minutes in the morning? Will that work? It will help. It will help. And that's actually one of the recommendations I make to people who live in urban environments where going outside still because of tall buildings still doesn't give them direct access to the sun. Um, or for people who have to, you know, for, for work or school or childcare reasons, have to wake way before, um, you know, the, the sun actually rises, particularly in the wintertime. So, yeah, a full spectrum light bulb that includes those, um, those blue lights and LEDs are a great option here. Um, you can get what's basically a, um, a little light box that's often used to treat seasonal affective disorder. And um, you can get those that are about as bright as about 10,000 lux. So you're getting pretty much what you would get outside on a cloudy day. And you can use that for 10 or 15 minutes to synchronize your circadian rhythms. And that can be putting on your makeup in the morning or reading a book or drinking your coffee or whatever. That's good. It's acceptable to good. It's not great because it's not, um, it's not uh, as bright as it could be if it was full sun outside. And um, I think also it's, it's a little bit like the blue blocking glasses where, yes, it's helpful, um, but it's only kind of part of that equation. Because I think if you can imagine the difference between sitting in front of a bright light that's 12 inches from your face for 10 or 15 minutes in the morning, no matter what you're doing inside in getting ready for your day, it's a very different experience than stepping outside, sitting in a chair or walking for 10 minutes in bright natural light while breathing fresh air and moving your body, even if it's in a very casual way, it's a very different sort of organism level experience. So um, yes, those, are, those kinds of tools are really helpful. And I, I frequently recommend them um, when we can't control all of the factors, when, we, when there's just simply no way to experience the more natural version. But if we can get to the place where we're having a little bit of movement, a little bit of fresh air, a little bit of exposure to green spaces or blue spaces, kind of a little bit of a natural environment, even if it's just a small garden outside or some, you know, a lawn at the city park, um, that definitely has a, a down regulating effect on our stress levels in ways that sitting in front of a light box simply wouldn't have. So in general, the principle, the heuristic here continues to be the closer we can get to our truly natural environments, the better off we're going to be, broadly speaking. Great segue. Uh, so forest bathing, uh, you kind of alluded to that. Is, come on, is that a real thing or? It is a real thing. Um, it's not a thing that we're very familiar with in North America, um, but other cultures, particularly in Japan, um, the idea of immersing ourselves into a very calming, restorative natural environment has um, profound effects on our physiology, particularly of our nervous system. And um, the research is quite robust on the way that being in that kind of environment can settle and ground and balance our nervous system's reactivity. So said another way, said the opposite, because I'll remind listeners that the spending time in the forest or in any natural environment is effectively our organism level, our biological baseline. So even though it seems like a kind of a stretch or a weird thing to go and do, um, that's actually our baseline. That's what our bodies expect. And in the modern world, of course, we've created an entirely different scenario. So going back to the place where we are spending time in quietude, in stillness, perhaps alone, not necessarily, but perhaps alone is a very healing, calming, stabilizing um, experience and can really help us manage the chronic stress of the fast paced, urbanized, digitized modern world. So um, it's a, in the same way as eating an ancestrally informed or sort of paleo type or evolutionary type diet, um, spending time in the natural environment is profoundly healing and the more I can do of it, and the more people can do of it um, in their own lives, the better off they're going to be. What does the dense city dweller do in those circumstances? 
That's a good question uh, because again, a lot of this, a lot of the answers to these questions are damage control answers. They are. There's not a perfect answer, but we'll get this close as we can. So, in a very urbanized environment, uh, a lot of it looks like um, getting out to city parks when and when, when you can. It looks like um, getting your feet in the grass, sitting even in a really busy place like New York City. There are parks and trees and areas that you can do that. There are flower beds. There are there are m sort of mini oases of this experience. And really focusing on that part of it, I think, can be more impactful and more restorative than we actually imagine. One of the other things that's interesting is that even looking at pictures of beautiful natural spaces can have a lesser degree of um, calming, soothing, restorative um, uh, experiences to it. So if you can't actually get anywhere near, um, you know, plants, trees, water, like that kind of thing, um, even looking at a, um, like a, like a coffee table book of beautiful photographs of natural environments, surprisingly, it sounds very trite and quaint and almost like a throwaway recommendation, but it can actually be really helpful. And then when you can on weekends, on vacations, really prioritize getting into those natural environments. Um, because again, many of us have real restrictions in um, the things we can and can't do. And so for things that we can't easily do on an everyday basis, when we can on times when we have full control, really making sure that we prioritize those healing experiences. Okay, we talked about, uh, we talked about light, we talked about outside. How should, and you talked about this when you started, how should our food choices change with the season? Yeah, um, I'm actually really curious to hear your perspective on this because I'm certainly familiar with your work as well. And, um, you know, the, the, the short heuristic is eat the foods that are locally seasonally available in your area. Um, my general recommendations on food look like some omnivorous mix of meat, seafood, and eggs, a uh, wide range of nutrient dense whole plant foods like vegetables and fruit and nuts and seeds and um, the inclusion of large amounts of you know whole unprocessed uh, natural fat sources whether it's from animals or plants or both so that can change across the course of the season and what i find most interesting about the nutritional aspect of this paradigm is that it partly explains a lot of the very confusing and conflicting nutritional research. Because if you can delve into the research, you can find um, fairly good research on uh, Mediterranean diet, on paleo diet, on low carb, high fat, on uh, plant-based or vegan or vegetarian approaches, on a ketogenic approach. And so there's this real confusion um, amongst, um, I think, the kind of the average person. They're like, I don't know which one of the things things is true. This doctor says one thing. This doctor says something else. This nutritionist says nutritionist says something else. And I think if we think about the amazing adaptations, the, ama the, the amazing um, versatility of the human organism, we can recognize that there are, we are able to physiologically and metabolically adapt to a wide range of different nutritional inputs. So. Um, if I could just sort of structure this across the course of the seasons, a Mediterranean diet that is rich in things like uh, poultry or seafood or eggs and uh, lots of vegetables and healthy fat sources um, might look a lot like a springtime kind of diet. Well, what's available in the spring? Um, a plant-based um, or vegetarian approach that is really um, rich in a wide range of seasonally available plants um, both vegetables and fruit, um, with less emphasis on fat and protein, might look like a summertime diet. The fall might look like a paleo type or low carb, high fat, kind of a little more um, emphasis on protein and fat, a little less emphasis on fresh greens, um, and that might look like a fall diet. And then a really carb restricted or even ketogenic diet might look like the winter because there's just not the same availability of fresh plant matter, especially carbohydrate rich um, fruits. So if you map things out that way, what you see is that there's the, the opportunity for adaptation um, across the course of the season so that we can get the insulin sensitizing effects of many of these different approaches. We can get the anti-inflammatory effects. 
we also don't get stuck eating the same foods you know, over and over and over. So there's sort of a food cycling component to it there. And we also have the opportunity to notice for ourselves with sort of cyclical experimentation, what approaches work best for us. And, you know, I'll hearken back to my work with the whole 30. Ultimately the whole 30 is a, a short term 30 day experiment on what foods work well for you. And we can continue to do that across the course of many seasons. So we continue to learn more and more and more about our own individual immunological sensitivities and metabolic preferences. Um, and so I think there's an opportunity for us in the food realm to shift our dietary approaches. On one end, it's incredibly simple. Eat what's available locally for you. Um, on the other end, it can look very um, contrived and structured. And I'm going to do a ketogenic approach in the winter and I'm going to do a plant-based lower fat approach in the summer. But really, it's all the same story. What's underneath that um, is really all the same story. And I think there's a way to think about food that is less complicated than m m many of us really do. Yeah, I think that's a good description. Um, I've uh, tried to make uh, people cycle uh, their, their diets. Uh, I think this is now my 18th year of from January through June during the week. I don't eat any breakfast, I don't eat any lunch, and I eat all my calories in a two hour window between six right. and eight o'clock at night. And so far, uh, so I'm 18 years into that. And why, why do I do such a stupid thing? Um, <laughs> well, number one, you know, my, my research as an undergraduate at Yale was human evolutionary and social biology. And how do you take a great ape, manipulate its food supply, manipulate its environment, and get a human? And so uh, one of the things great apes only only gain weight in the summer, and they actually only eat fruit in the summer because that's when it's available. And, right. they, and they gain about eight to 10 pounds. Um, uh, for instance, orangutans, female orangutans, don't come in into heat until they've gained eight pounds from eating fruit. Right. Um, and, you know, most hibernating animals eat lots of carbohydrates or actually lots of protein. Um, bears will eat huge amounts of protein from salmon and carbohydrates from berries, and they become insulin resistant so that they will pour, store fat. Absolutely. And then they don't eat for five months. Uh, yep. So, and you look at, you know, modern hunter-gatherers like the Hansa, they follow a very cyclically eating pattern. And the really cool thing is their gut microbiome changes like a 180 between seasons. Right. And I think uh, that we were designed to cyclically change our gut microbiome, literally totally change the species. And that communication uh, of those different species with the organism they live in, us, uh, I, I talked about it in the longevity paradox, I think is paramount to long-term health. Mm -hmm. And as I, I talk about in my next book, The Energy Paradox, people are gonna be blown away by the effect our microbiome have on our energy production. It is, it's actually scary uh, how much dependence we have at every level on mm -hmm. the health of our microbiome. So, yeah, I agree with you. Um, you know, we have different approaches. I, I've certainly in my practice with, you know, 70% of my practice is now autoimmune disease. I've certainly become wary of the effect of lectins on, on the average American whose right. who's gut microbiome has been decimated, our protective ability. There's a recent new paper that shows you can actually put in some really good bugs that eat gluten and break gluten into smaller particles that become harmless. And I just published a paper at the American Heart Association last month taking lectins away from gluten sensitive people and following them for six months and they actually, uh, in nine out of 10 out of 50, became tolerant to gluten. We could reintroduce it to them. 
Interesting. And it's because their gut microbiome changed, and it's because right. they no longer had leaky gut, so their immune system was no longer on overload. Right. Well, it's interesting you should mention that because my very first foray into um, nutrition as a scientific approach um, really happened reading about autoimmunity and lectins. Um, I read a paper by Lauren Cordain back in yeah. 2005 or 2006. And at the time I was playing national level of volleyball, I had a chronic uh, shoulder tendinosis and couldn't get the inflammation to subside and hadn't even occurred to me that my diet would be a part of that because I thought I was eating conventionally healthy and everything was good. And based on that one particular paper, I started doing some personal experimentation and all I did was eliminated legumes and grains from my diet for six weeks. That's the only change I made. Didn't do anything else. I just stopped eating those because they're rich sources of lectins. And um, six weeks later, my shoulder that had been bothering me for over a year was completely pain-free and fully functional. And, and that utterly blew my mind, um, the fact that um, some simple, simple dietary change like that in an otherwise healthy dietary approach um, could have that significant of effect on my ability to heal peripheral musculoskeletal tissue. Like that just totally blew my world open. And that was really the starting point for my whole foray into nutrition study. So um, lectins have been something that have been kind of on my radar for a long, long time. And I think, um, I, I think I heard you say that with a healthy gut and an oscillating microbiome, um, intermittent exposure to certain dietary lectins is probably not a big problem. Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's, uh, do I think that the vast majority of Americans, because of our antibiotic use, because of our antacid use, because of glyphosate and everything, have probably the worst microbiome in the world, and most of us have a leaky gut. Do I think with regimented control, you can take control over this and restore your gut and your gut wall? Yes, and I've published papers about that. Uh, and do I foray into trying these things? Yes, I do. Uh, but I usually regret it, quite frankly. Uh. Um, so uh, I think I'm more tolerant to it uh, than I used to be, certainly. But I have a number of my autoimmune patients, they can't cheat. Um, yeah, you know, they just can't. And when yeah. we can measure it, I mean, or either they're going to tell me or we can see it in their blood work. Totally. Uh, so, um, all right. So um, one thing we haven't talked about is exercise. Should yeah. you change your exercise routine over the year? Well, of course, that's a trick question because <laughs> the obvious answer is yes. In the same way as all of these other things should change as your environment outside changes. So in the same way as your food supply changes, in the same way as the light-dark cycle changes, so does what's going on outside and our natural um, sort of desires and drives to do things. So it feels really normal to, um, in the first warm days of spring, want to get outside, to go to the park, to go on a bike ride, to work in the garden. Like that's what we are drawn to do naturally. And the more we can notice and pay attention to and validate those intuitions that are in us, the better off we're going to be big picture. And so we'll take that very palpable dopamine driven spring experience and then we'll move that forward through the season. So here's how it goes. In the summertime, it looks like lots of time outside, going hiking, riding our bikes, swimming at the lake, playing catch, throwing the frisbee for our dog, whatever. Um, and that's a really natural thing to do, to be outside for large amounts of time to have um, many hours a day um, of relatively low intensity general physical activity and every now and then pick up and move something heavy. So you're maintaining the musculoskeletal structure and that might like look like uh, wheelbarrowing or hauling bags of mulch in the yard or digging with a shovel or carrying wood for a construction project. It might look like going to the gym and doing some resistance training. Um, but there's this anchor, this consistent theme throughout all of the seasons of um, an anchor of um, real world functional strength training. And that looks like picking things up, squatting, lifting, carrying, climbing things. Um, much like we did when we were children, you know, we climbed trees, we scrambled up rock faces, we, we raced each other across the park. Um, and those are the kinds of things that are unstructured and really, really good for 
adult humans as well, uh, because we've become excessively contrived and um, and and overstructured even in our exercise programs. So I also call for more general movement, walking to the grocery store to you know an extra mile to carry your groceries, um, even though it's more physical work. It's also I think um, better from a physiological standpoint. And there is this also this strange and subtle experience of sort of foraging and bringing something home in the same way if you've ever had your own vegetable garden and you've picked your own greens out of the garden or carrots and brought them inside and washed the dirt off and eaten them for dinner. There's a sense of satisfaction and, and connection that's there that isn't present when you have food shipped to your door um, or you go to the grocery store and park, you know, right outside the door. So um, the fall version then looks a lot like spring. It's a sort of a, a moving in the direction of contraction. It is um, less duration and more intensity in our activity. Um, so it still looks like um, a wide mix of um, real world activities, but it's less, you know, less of the many, many hours outside and somewhat contracted. Um, and then winter is the total opposite pole to summer. So winter is a lot less overall physical activity. Um, and I'm not necessarily endorsing being sedentary but what i'm saying is the you know four or eight hours outside on the weekends is not something you're probably going to want to do as much of in the winter and that's normal and that's totally okay and the anchor behavior of functional strength training remains so general movement um you know and there's, there's sort of an inverse relationship between intensity and duration um, across the course of the season so summer is relatively low intensity with long duration Winter is higher average intensity and shorter average duration. Um, and within all of those parameters, you can choose a wide range of different um, either exercise programs or just kind of real life stuff. And I really encourage people to do more real life stuff like going rock climbing or um, going trail running or things that are less linear and less binary and a little more oscillatory and three dimensional. Okay, so what you're saying is I can't sit on the couch all winter. Uh, but hey, I'm you, not eating, so it's okay, right? <laughs> right. Well, isn't that an interesting thing, right? Because when we, this is how we get the cross linkages between these different systems. So in the winter time, when you are having a, a wildly shortened feeding window, you're probably taking in fewer calories because you're oh, e yeah. emphasizing protein and fat, which have higher satiety signaling. And um, so your total caloric expenditure um, because you're doing less physical activity is lower, but that's also, that's also okay because you're perhaps taking in fewer calories overall. Um, and again, there's lots of ways to slice and dice that, but, um, that's often what happens with people when they are doing less physical activity and they're eating more satiety inducing foods. Um, so yeah, and it's totally okay. And of course the carbohydrate restriction and the, um, shortened feeding windows have an insulin sensitizing effect, which partly mitigates the fact that you're not doing as much activity. So there's these beautiful and elegant off, you know, kind of balancing systems where in the summertime, which is the opposite of that, where you're doing, you're, you're eating more carbohydrate, you're sleeping less, you're basically under recovered for the period of summertime. You're doing a lot of physical activity, you're generating a lot of oxidative stress. And also you, what's happening is you are eating a lot of nutrient dense plant and animal foods that help to buffer some of that oxidative stress. And you're improving insulin, insulin sensitivity through um, long duration, relatively low intensity physical activity. So you're staying insulin sensitive across the course of the entire year using different mechanisms to do so, but you're never getting to a state where you are sedentary, chronically inflamed and insulin resistant. Yeah, I've uh, told a number of my patients, very overweight patients, that I can put them on the grizzly bear diet and uh, lock them in a room and have them not eat for five months. And I guarantee you it's incredibly effective for weight loss. And, Absolutely. And it actually protects uh, muscle mass, which is right. And uh, I don't have a whole lot of takers on the grizzly bear diet. <laughs> no, but but you make an interesting point, though, is that a lot of these these same sort of physiological underpinnings, these echoes of our evolutionary past still exist in us today. And we can leverage some of those patterns um, and not necessarily have to lock ourselves in a room with nothing but meat and fat for five months. But we can leverage some of those same systems to our benefit um, while still enjoying nutritious, delicious food and having a social life and, you know, doing physical activity. So um, 
But I, I love that you gave that example because it's a hundred percent true. Um, and we can just extrapolate some of the same principles there um, for our own sort of health optimization. So before we go, what is one thing in the book that would surprise people? Hmm. Ah, so here's one. Um, it's not necessarily a big one, but it's one that I've said and people kind of look at me sideways sometimes. I am against New Year's resolutions. And the reason I'm against New Year's resolutions is because um, our bodies don't know when January 1st is. They don't know anything about the calendar year. And so uh, just declaring to ourselves and to people around us that on this certain day in midwinter, we are going to initiate some new behavior program, whether it's an exercise program or a diet or whatever the commitment we've made to ourselves and other people is, I argue that midwinter is the least opportune time to do that because winter is for rest and restoration and thinking and retrospecting and planning for the future. And really it's preparing ourselves to go out into the world in the coming spring. And that's true both in the literal spring and also so the sort of figurative spring and also true on the shortened timeline. It's true of nighttime going into morning. And so if we don't do each nighttime going into morning or winter going into spring, effectively, um, we are not going to be very energetic come springtime. So I actually argue that a New Year's resolution is more properly placed in early spring and is dreamed about and planned for and prepared for in the midwinter. So uh, I think that New Year's resolutions should be mid-March or something. Perfect. All right. Very good. Well, Dallas, thanks so much for uh, coming on today. Uh, where can listeners find all about you and your work and where can they get the hands on the book? So the Four Seasons Solution is available pretty much everywhere books are sold. Um, I encourage uh, readers to support their local independent booksellers. Right now during um, kind of pandemic time, that's tough to do. But if you can find um, independent booksellers online, I, I encourage you to do that. Um, it's also available uh, Barnes & Noble and Amazon and many of the major booksellers as well. Um, there's also information available on my website, dallashartwig.com. And I'm moderately active on Instagram as well. All right. Very good. Well, awesome. take care of yourself and uh, congratulations on the book. Great talking to you. Thanks so much. All right. So we got the audience questions. Suzanne E. on YouTube wrote in and asked, does taking vitamin D in large doses affect your heart or arteries? So there's every now and then interesting studies that come up that vitamin D in large doses may affect your bones may affect your arteries, but none of those studies have actually looked at the combination of vitamin D3 with vitamin K2. And you've heard me talk over and over again that if you're going to take generous doses of vitamin D3, which I do recommend, you should absolutely take vitamin K2 as well. And let me give you one extra little piece of advice. There is very good research showing that statin drugs actually increase calcification in coronary arteries, which seems extraordinary because you should decrease calcification in coronary arteries if you believe in statins. But the literature shows that statins interfere with the effect of vitamin K2. So here's my tip for the day. If you're taking a statin drug and you folks know who you are, please, please, please add vitamin K2 to your regimen. You don't need much. You really only need 100 micrograms or so of either MK4 or MK7 or both preferably. So great question. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you.